One of the things I never had as an undergraduate student, and certainly wasn't even thinking about as a high school student, was some kind of RSS feed. That's funny to me now because it's one of the first things you get in grad school. For anyone not aware, the basic idea is to subscribe to a journal's feed, which will show you all the latest articles being published. Pick the journals you want, scan through the latest releases, and pick out the papers you want to read based on their abstracts, titles, or table of contents images. Staying on top of the literature is pretty important in most fields of science, but today I want to talk about RSS feeds and how they can help you with getting started in scientific illustration. I want to make it clear that I didn't formally train to be a scientific illustrator. What I did do was 10 plus years of formal training in science and engineering, and a reasonable amount of work with CAD for designing lab parts, instruments, and technical setups. Also, because of the time I've invested in learning how to technically break down 3D graphics, I've managed to bridge a bit of a gap between scientific illustration and the research itself. And that's an area I think is often overlooked. The part where scientists make their own graphics for their own presentations or published work. This is not to be confused with what I would consider professional scientific illustration, i.e. the type of thing you may see from a design studio. I want to note here that what I'm suggesting won't make you a scientific illustrator or a great artist. What I'll affectionately call proper scientific illustration is something I consider to be very meticulous and well considered. It is somewhat the difference between a cool graphic on a popular science website that shows a carbon nanotube and a journal figure that tells you the chirality and configuration of the specific nanotube and why that matters. I'm going for a little bit more of the former because I think it's actually a good place to start from on either end. And in subsequent videos, I'll talk about moving more towards precision and some of the resources for doing that. As I mentioned, the first thing I recommend doing is getting a journal feed. Many people speak highly of Feedly. I use the old reader. It's free, it does the job. Choose a series of journals and follow them. In my experience, the highest production quality graphics come from the Wiley journals, and the best scientific figures are usually from ACS or RSC journals, though that is a very chemistry biased statement since that is my field of study. Now, as I mentioned, I don't consider myself necessarily an artist, more of a technician. Having a grasp of framing, color, lighting, and all of the other considerations that make a skilled artist or designer is very non-trivial, and developing a personal style takes a lot of time and effort. By similar token, conveying to an artist with no scientific background what I'm trying to communicate and why can be quite tricky without getting into the technical and often jargon-filled weeds. Still, the thing I like about RSS feeds is that without knowing anything about the science or the art, you can at least see what people are putting out, what is getting accepted, and what is getting published, and usually because of the way the feeds work, you can do that without having to encounter the journal paywalls. Up until now, we've been looking at a segment of my much larger PureRef board, which is essentially a collection of a few hundred journal covers, and I update this pretty regularly. At a simple level, what this lets me do is see what kind of figures are being made, and it helps inform the tutorials that I design. If there are 200 plus covers that have some sort of graphene, or a mouse, or a cell structure, that's clearly a type of figure people want to make. So if I can teach it, or conversely, if you can learn it, then you can make those types of figures for other people or for yourself. The thing that I like to do as more of a scientist with RSS feeds and with my reference images is to crop to just the graphic. I always keep all of the original info, so titles, authors, etc., so I can give credit to whoever created the work, but it's also a very useful way to assess the graphics. In this sense, what I want to say is when I uncrop this figure, could I have inferred from just the graphic alone what elements were going into the title? And this is a distinction that I like to make because journal covers and figures are different, and they should be treated that way. A lot of covers are flashy and not necessarily as concerned with scientific accuracy, but they grab your attention, which is their job, and as a result, they may be a little bit less scientific. They often convey the simplest message that is the most accessible to a general audience. For the record, that is completely fine because scientific visuals don't often make sense. You can't see certain things without instruments or analysis, and artistic license is okay. I'm obviously not an authority on that, but that is my observation from plenty of papers. And if we move over to the advanced materials section of this board, you can see in many ways, a roll cake is not necessarily an indication of anything scientific, but it does capture your attention and you wonder what is being conveyed here. So that is doing its job. Another example of that is that for many covers that are dealing with flexible electronics or sensors integrated with the human body, often there's just some sort of vague human form that may or may not be holographic in some capacity. You can see a skeleton, a man, a brain, there's a hand somewhere over here, there it is, and there's another one right down there. But this is doing the job of conveying to you what the goal is and what the work is probably about. In contrast, I tend to turn a much harsher eye on figures. Does your graphic have meaning? What can I learn about your work at a high level from glancing at it? If you have a basic stack of layers in a device, which one is the new one? What makes this work special? How does your graphic highlight that? 
At the simplest level, I want to be able to at least guess some of the words in the title of your article by just looking at your figures. And if I can, that means you've done a good job communicating your work. In this case, if I undo the crop, you can see we're dealing with a PVA-assisted exfoliation for a transparent mem-resistive photosynaptic device. Now, I might not be able to garner all of that from just the image, but I have a rough sense that there is an important layer and it involves this PVA-assisted exfoliation method. So I would say that this is doing a good job communicating as a TOC. To me, what sets apart good from great is how well you've drawn attention to the important parts and then how visually compelling your graphics are. All of this to say that if you're just starting out with more of a research-based scientific career, or if you're an artist who wants to know how you can move into scientific illustration, get yourself an RSS feed, find some journals, and from a technical standpoint, ask how you could make that kind of figure. If you already know how to do that, then ask how effectively that graphic is communicating the research in question. At a detailed level, this isn't a substitute for years of artistic training, nor is it a substitute for years of studying a specific area, but it's a great place to start for people who are interested and just want a sense of what people are communicating and how. If you're interested in pursuing a career in research as well, this can help you get a head start and a feel for how scientific publishing operates. As many journals are moving towards open access, there's also an opportunity to read some of the work and learn about the fields in question. So, as always, thanks for coming out. If you found this video interesting or helpful, consider subscribing. If you have resources you'd like to share or other suggestions for starting out and bridging the gap between scientists and artists, throw them in the comments or email me about them if you think they belong in a future video. In the future, I'm going to be breaking down many of these figures and sort of assessing them on a kind of a critique basis, but also just examining aspects I like, aspects I don't, things that are, you know, really stand out about many of these figures, and many of them are exceptional. So we're also going to do occasional breakdowns on how some of these are made. In fact, this little panel down here of selections is among the first where I'm going to discuss how some of these could be made in longer form videos that will really just take a whole figure and break down how we could do everything in there over a longer video. If that sounds interesting to you, consider checking back in the future. Thanks again to the many people who have supported me on Patreon, and until next time, you have yourselves a great old day.